We need tough leadership to grow. A leader must be a leader. Support Prime Minister Trudeau. Emery didn't waste any time getting into politics. He was now old enough to vote, and in 1979, he waded into the federal election. He tied his hopes to the new Democratic Party. I first met Mark Emery in 1979 when there was a federal election going on, and I was the candidate for the NDP in London East, and Mark Emery, strange as it may seem today, worked on my election campaign. Mark, I think, was attracted to the NDP, I think, somewhat paradoxically because, and probably he didn't understand really what the NDP was all about, because he believed that the NDP as a party stood for complete, unlimited, unfettered individual freedom. Then came Ayn Rand and the Fountainhead. The Fountainhead was the first book I read that articulated the right of a person to lead their own life without having to be subject to the uh, sacrifice uh, that others would impose on you. The Fountainhead is about a revolutionary architect who refuses to let society mainstream his work into ordinary buildings. When his designs for a public housing project are changed to fit popular tastes, he destroys the project to preserve his individuality. Look at history. Everything we have, every great achievement has come from the independent work of some independent mind. Every horror and destruction came from attempts to force men into a herd of brainless, soulless robots. My terms are a man's right to exist for his own sake. And Ayn Rand, as I said, is, is a kind of politics that appeals very much to the adolescent mind. It, it's unencumbered by subtlety or contradiction, which is what the real world is about. But uh, the Ayn Rand view of the world is, is pure and uncluttered by any sort of considerations like that. And that's Mark Emery's view of the world, a purely ideological notion about the world. The interesting thing was that while Mark Emery worked on my campaign in the federal election of 1979 and the federal election of 1980, Mark Emery was an opposing candidate. I ran again in London East for the NDP, and Mark was the candidate in London East for the Freedom Party, or perhaps it was the Libertarian Party. It's hard to keep the, the name changes separate. And he ran on um, essentially the same platform that he keeps raving about in the newspapers and on television in London, that the state should not impose any limits or any restrictions on the freedom of individuals. Martin placed third in the election. Emery placed fourth, but was determined to find an outlet for Ayn Rand and libertarianism. So he founded a weekly newspaper, the London Tribune. It was a major failure. I thought we must have a newspaper. Well, the consequence of which basically was I lost $40,000 in three months of my life in the most harrowing, t trying period of my life ever. I find out that I was completely incompetent to run large numbers of people. Um, I also aided, I helped other people lose over a quarter million dollars. I got most of my family to invest in it. It was really traumatizing at the time, uh, but a lot of great things came out of it. I learned that I did have limitations, that although I felt I was talented then, and I may be talented, that there were obviously things I would need to mature in order to do successfully. And so it taught me a great deal about planning properly in the future, about uh, learning my limitations, and about perhaps going slower. During his brief experience as a publisher, Emery intensified his campaign against the London Business Improvement Area, an organization that charged a special tax to downtown merchants to beautify and publicize the city core. Rather than pay the annual tax of $32, Emery spent $20,000 in three years trying to dismantle the organization. My first lesson was that it's just incredibly time-consuming, very hard, uh, very frustrating and very expensive to oppose the system. Uh, amazingly, it didn't deter me. I don't know why, but it didn't. I remember that as being particularly grueling and frustrating, um, especially since we came close to getting rid of the tax. I mean, we were one vote away in city council, and it probably would have been better if they'd all you know, voted against it, and then I would have given up on all this and saved all that cash and become very rich. It just set me on a career of troublemaking like that. They hate you for your integrity. They hate you because they know they can neither corrupt you nor rule you. They won't let you survive. He didn't really date a lot of girls and, and 
do a lot of crazy things the way other teenagers do. So I think he made up for that. He, he was so busy all the time, and I think he needed some place to settle down at in the evening. And I always thought it was kind of strange because he is, he's, you know, kind of a wild guy, and, but he really needed that home base. When I met Sandy, uh, the woman when I was 22, who had children, uh, you know, you just can't say, well, you know, I'm going to fall in love with you and you'll have to sell your children for scientific experiments. You know, basically, I fall in love with you, I'm going to have to obviously uh, learn to become a father and try and make as good a job as is possible. You have to accept challenges that are put your way. I mean, to me, that's part of personal responsibility. Sometimes things happen to us that we would prefer otherwise, initially, or things that happen to us that we don't plan on, but we have to adapt. And parenthood's the biggest of all those kind of unexpected contingencies one has to become adaptable to, but it's also a very rewarding one. He was always up. He was always energetic. He was, uh, it's the first thing in the morning, but, that isn't the case. What we see here are examples of magazines that have cleared Canada Customs and, in fact, are highly censored. This is the material you see... In 1983, Emery devoted his energy to the fight against censorship. In September of that year, a local feminist group had petitioned City Hall to restrict the sale of pornographic material in London. The other thing I'd like to see legislatively is a real clear definition that any form of pornography, including children, and any suggestion of any sexual poses would be considered obscene. Unfortunately, the issue on sexually explicit material has become very clouded because a lot of people are under the misconception that there is material in the city or in this country for that matter. That Emery encouraged variety store owners to band together and resist police raids on their magazine racks. He argued that the sale of pornography was not just symbolic of free speech, but was the only way most small businesses could turn a profit. Emery even advertised in the student paper of the University of Western Ontario's engineering school. Most of the publication's contents consisted of crude jokes about women. Then the battle for pornography became personal when a young feminist stepped in. So I wrote a letter to each of the advertisers in the newspaper. Emery was one of the advertisers. I just basically said, you know, this is a racist, homophobic, misogynistic publication. Are you aware of what you're, um, you're supporting here with your advertising dollars? The next thing I knew, there was this huge blow up of the letter I had written in the front store of the City Lights bookstore, or front uh, window of the City Lights bookstore, with this, uh, these cutouts of women in, in leather Nazi uniforms pasted all around the letter with the, with the heading, fascist feminists are at it again. Uh, referring to me, of course, um, you know, how dare I presume to suggest that maybe someone think about whether or not they wanted to uh, support a racist and misogynist publication. Well, you know, I grew up in a culture where the more sexual explicitness we had, the better. The more nude beaches we had, the better. The more sex people were having, the better. The more sexual explicitness, the better. And I still believe that. We, the, the problem with our society is that people just aren't having enough sex. And if people were having sex... As soon as the discussion of pornography as anything but a censorship issue came up, uh, he just completely lost, lost track of what he was talking about. Um, you know, he decided, well, it's freedom of speech. Everybody has to be able to say what they want, um, which, you know, looks great on paper. And I'm certainly not uh, for censoring pornography, but I am for discussing it. I'm, I am for talking about it and talking about it and talking about it and showing it for what it is. For this morning, the feminist movement with my guest Heidi Strasser, who is a member of the London St uh, Status of Women Action Group and also the Women's Issues Commission at Western. Mark Emery is with me this morning, the campaign. That particular interview was really, I couldn't call it a, a debate. <laughs> because uh, Mr. Emery, I think, hogged about 90% of the airtime. Even Wayne McLean was having a difficult time getting, getting a word in edgewise, as I recall. Oh. <laughs> a lot of women who are in pornography, and this is probably going to shock you, are uh, kidnapped in one way or another. Oh, and I think that that's okay, Mark. Okay, that's insane. <laughs> that, yeah, I, I agree. They're they're not be, they're not there out of choice. Oh, that's And I'm saying if a woman really wants to be a porn star, all the power to her. But let but her make that wanna, decision. No, you want to take away her income. You want to deny her. No, the, I don't. People the access no. to her.